Thank you. You may be seated. Well, thank you for being here today. We are here to honor and remember and celebrate the life of James Lee Pop Revis. He passed away on March 13th at Watauga Medical Center. He was surrounded by his loving family. He was 81 years old or young and is survived by his wife, Helen Marie, his children, Madeline and husband Jack, Hank and wife, Donna, Clark and fiance, Gina, and Chuck and wife, Michelle, as well as his brother, Richard and wife, Beth, Stepsons Justin and wife Shiloh, Michael and Elizabeth, Billy and Leanne, and 15 grandchildren, 13 great grandchildren. What a legacy. We have gathered today to celebrate James's life, honor his memory, comfort one another, seek and give glory to God. And while we are grieved by his passing and his absence, we know that James is no longer suffering. We have hope that he is more alive today than we are. And that he is in the very presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we have come together to honor and remember the legacy of a man who has touched all of our lives. We thank you for the opportunity to know, to have spent time with, and to be impacted by James's life. Father, today as we all feel in some sense his absence, God, we are thankful that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so, Father, we celebrate that he is with you, that he has finished the good fight of faith, and that he has received a crown of life. Father, he has gone before us. He has championed and uh, represented to us a life moving into the future. And Father, I pray that the future that he now has would be one that each of us would choose through Jesus Christ. And God, we want to we wanna take time to comfort one another. I pray that the memories shared, that the experiences that we've had, that as we share those today, that it would be an encouragement to each of our hearts. Lord, that we would have joy in exchange for sorrow. And that we would have hope that there is life beyond the grave. Father, I pray your strength, your hand of comfort on each of these family members and friends. And we just invite you, Lord Jesus, to do what you alone can do, and that is shepherd our hearts through the valley of the shadow of death. So we welcome you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. James is in a place that you and I can only imagine. And as great as our imagination may be, and as great as God's word is at describing this place, we have only been told a glimpse of what awaits God's children. And so to begin, I'm going to invite Nate Arnold to come. And sing a song that reminds us of where James now is. And hopefully it's a place that will inspire you to want to be there with him one day. Amen.
Let me read to you a verse out of the book of Revelation that explains and describes a little bit about that place. It says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with him and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death nor sorrow nor crying, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have been passed away. One of James's prerequisites for what we're doing right now is that we laugh. It was his orders. And so to make that possible, or at least help make that possible, we're going to call upon one of our elders this afternoon. And I think when you hear him, you'll know why. You know, Jesus, when he talks about and he shares parables about this transition from earth into heaven, and there's one where he says, enter into the joy of the Lord. You see, joy is beyond an emotion. Joy is a reality of the heart that God gives us by his spirit. And so I hope that even in your grief today, you will experience the joy of the Lord right here and right now, Elder Joe Fireball. Will you come and uh, honor James with some words that might make us laugh? (laughs) So, uh, Helen Marie asked if I would speak today. She told me that James wanted people to laugh. And at first, I was very honored and touched, a little teary-eyed. 
Um, but then I got confused because I've never witnessed James laugh at anything I've said. <laughs> I, I'm being honest. I, and then the confusion turned to laughter, and I'll tell you why. I imagined him thinking to himself, how can I get him one last time? <laughs> so asking me to make a room full of people laugh at a celebration of life, that's got to be one of the hardest crowds to deal with and getting you to laugh, as we were rightly grieving. But uh, James wanted us all to be dressed nice and comfortable. He wanted Bojangles, and there's some Bojangles downstairs. And he wanted us to laugh. And that, that's the kind of guy I love. That's the kind of guy I love. Um, the first time I spent time with James, I didn't know what I was getting into. He asked for a little bit of help to lay a patio in his front yard. And so me and Mott Pruitt, uh, another elder, were there. And uh, as you can imagine, when you're doing manual labor, especially in a squatted position, it gets quite painful, but it also gets quite funny. Uh, we were all a little not very balanced. We were falling over all half the time, joking, laughing. And uh, I was sharing jokes, mostly dad jokes, like what's red and hurts your teeth? A brick. <laughs> he, he didn't laugh. What do, you, what do you call a hippie's wife? Mississippi. So these are the kinds of jokes I like. Uh, but I was telling him, and we were laughing. Well, me and Mott and I were laughing. He was not. Instead, he was correcting me all the time on how to lay this block. And I was impressed at how much he knew how to lay block, and then it realized he had done it for a good portion of his life. No one told me this. But I did get, catch a glimpse. He didn't care that I was doing the block wrong. I mean, although he did mention he wanted it perfect for Helen Marie. That actually wasn't his heart. He wanted me to learn something from him because of all those years that he had done it. He wanted to impart it to me. It was very obvious to me that he was actually doing it in a fatherly way. But as he's like constantly telling me how I could improve, it reminded me of a story I decided to tell him. I once helped move this sweet lady for the fifth to 15th time, I lost count, and she may be related to our pastor. I'm just saying maybe, maybe not. And uh, we were moving furniture for her and we did something, I don't exactly remember what it was. She said something really innocuous, but I decided to make it awkward. I decided to say, well, you get what you pay for, because I wasn't getting paid to move her furniture. Without missing a beat, she reaches for a purse and says, well, here, let me get you a little something so you'll do a better job. Again, I didn't see any laughter. <laughs> so he takes us to this hole-in-the-wall restaurant that I now love to eat at, but I had never been at before. Uh, it's called Rody's Parkway Restaurant. It's a little, to a little hole in the wall in Glendale Springs. How many people have eaten there? If you haven't, you should. It's really good food. Anyway, we walk in there, and he gets called by his first name, as if he was family there. I'm not 100% sure, but I think they may even ask him if he wanted his usual. I mean, that's how often he visited there. And this is where I really learn about James. He opens up and he shares all his experiences uh, of the things, mostly about the things he had done in his life. And I remember thinking, this man has lived three lives. I mean, he wasn't just a block layer. He's done a restaurant, which actually I didn't learn that until recently. Help me out, Hillary. I mean, uh, trees. Um, landscaping. landscaping. I, I, yeah. <laughs> so he's lived three lives. And uh, he was beaming ear to ear as he was telling these stories and, and all the things that he had done. So we head back and uh, finish up the job. And as I'm leaving, Helen Marie obviously thanks us in the most gracious way she knows. You know, she, you know how she is. She, she has those words, honey and and you, you feel like a million dollars. But as I'm leaving, I say to her, I don't think James likes me very much because he didn't laugh at all today. She looks at me and cracks a smile. She goes, honey, he ain't heard a word you said. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> now, all that comes back around. This is, that might be why he's asked me to talk today because he's never heard one punchline. I think he only believed I was funny because Helen Marie told him he should. He, 
That's why he thinks I'm funny. He didn't really know. Sometime later, I decided to build a wife from, uh, build a bed for my wife. <laughs> build a wife. <laughs> that's, what, that's, what, that's what being a husband is. You build your wife. <laughs> I built this bed for her. And uh, I knew James was into woodworking. I had very little idea how much at that time. So I finished this bed and I show him pictures of it. And the look on his face is pure surprise. I, I don't think he, I think he just didn't think I had it in me. Uh, and little did he know, I really didn't. That was the hardest project I'd ever done. In fact, at one point I was on the floor staining some wood for this bed and the 200 pound headboard fell on my head and almost knocked me out. <laughs> and I shared that with him to which I may have gotten a chuckle on that. But this triggered a new friendship for us. Every couple of months or so, when I would see him at church, he would ask me, are you doing another wood project? And I would feel a little guilty because, no, I didn't really care for the first one. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't going to tell him that. And I'm glad I didn't because he real, that, for him, that was our kinship, doing this wood project. Uh, he would take me to his, he has a wood shop next to his house, and he has done wonders with that wood shop. And he shows me every tool. And I don't know how he does it, but every tool has a story of how he stole it, basically. <laughs> he would say, this is a $500 tool. I bought it for five bucks. I don't know how he was doing it, but that's what he's doing. But then he would say, but it cost about $500 to maintain it. I think he was kidding, but, uh, but he showed me every tool. And he would be beaming ear to ear as he would tell me about these tools and the things he would do. And then he would show me every project he was working on. He made a lot of cornhole games, tables, birdhouses. And one that he was really proud of was this whiskey barrel table. And he wasted no time to tell me how expensive these whiskey barrels were. And I said, well, of course, especially if you're buying them still full of whiskey. <laughs> I still didn't get a laugh out of him, but that time I don't think it's because he didn't hear me. I don't think he was, thought it was very funny. But that's what I want to leave with you. That's, those are the two of the things I, I learned about James, is he could take a piece of wood or see a, a scrap piece of wood, and it may look junky to us, but he could immediately see what it could be turned into. He saw the value in everything and what it could become. And he did the same with people. He could see the real potential in people. That's why when you get in a working position with him, he wanted to be a, a, a father or a grandfather or a teacher in that moment. He really saw the value in people. And, and he was also just a really good mentor. Uh, and I'm a better person for knowing him, and, I, and, I, and I'm so thankful that I didn't clue him in that I wasn't really that fond of woodworking. Uh, it was such a wonderful relationship that we had. Uh, the last thing, uh, I did like to pick with him a lot about some of the things. How many have seen James's work? He, he's really good at making wood items, but he made his wife these heart um, placemats. What do you call those things again? They're not placemats. They, they, chargers. Uh, chargers. I don't know what that is. That's, he made heart chargers, but I would turn them upside down and, and say, these are really good looking butt chargers you made. <laughs> That, that, was, that was, I almost feel a little guilty about that one. But anyway. It's uh, okay, he didn't hear you. <laughs> he, he didn't hear me. <laughs> uh, he did. And actually when he told me that I mumbled a lot, I actually did get self-conscious about that. I started wondering if I was. But I, it's an honor to speak to you today. I look around and I see all the people that could be up here and have have lots of stories to share, and I hope what little bit I did share uh, was exactly what he wanted from his heart. I, I believe that just hearing you laugh is, is it's good medicine. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. That's right. When he went, uh, when he left, Helen Marie shared that James came in and said, you know, I really like Joe, but he sure does mumble a lot. <laughs> So as a pastor on Sundays, I, I begin to wonder, was I mumbling? 
We have a, a very special part of the family. Heather and her husband are going to come at this time and share a praise song. And I think it's more than appropriate that during this time we lift up our hearts and our eyes to the Lord and that we honor him and praise him because he is good. God is good all the time. Life isn't always good. Circumstances aren't always good, but God is good. And so I hope that you'll be blessed as they share this song. so much. What a good reminder. Speaking of the goodness of God, I think um, if we could just capture the moments that we've all had with James, if we could talk about them and remember them, uh, we would be reminded of God's goodness. And I know that those memories are in your hearts. I know that you will treasure them But one of the things I think is so important about this time, this gathering, this coming together, is that when you take a person's life, any one of us may only know that person in part. You may know him as husband, as father, as brother, as grandfather, uh, all of these different ways of knowing James. But when we come together, 
we actually have the potential of knowing more fully who James was and even is now in the presence of the Lord. And so on behalf of the family, I want to offer an opportunity for just a brief amount of time for you, the family, the friends, to speak maybe one memory or one characteristic of who James was to you in reflection on his life. And as you do that, I would say that we'll all get a bigger picture of just who he was. So if you would like to share, this is how this can go. I would just invite you to stand up where you're seated, speak out, and share that moment or that memory with the congregation today. Who would like to get us started? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Beautiful. Who's next? I'm encouraged by how many of you came early to greet the family. I'm sure that you have shared some of those special memories, and it's important that you continue to do that because they truly will get a picture of just how great his life was, how far his impact continues to go. So please don't hesitate to remind them from time to time of what James meant to you before I move on. Anyone else? I want to make sure everyone's had that opportunity. Thank you. I was invited and asked to give a message honoring James's life, his memory, but also to encourage you as uh, his son Clark said, that James is happy now. He's all right. He's doing all right. Um, to remind us of where he is and of how to get there, which is very important. And so for the next few minutes, I, I want to talk to you of lessons that I've learned from James, from his life. 
I think we can all learn from his life. I think there are valuable lessons, not only Joe Fireball back there. Um, I never got to work with James uh, very much as far as carpentry goes or laying block for that matter. Um, but the times that I had around him uh, certainly impressed me. When you speak of him being a gentleman, um, he really was. Uh, he was known to not let Helen Marie drive if there was any possibility of inclement weather. He was going to drive her. A true gentleman in that sense. And uh, a gentleman from the beginning when they met. And I learned a little bit more about how they met or at least who uh, brought them together earlier. But one of the things I learned about their meeting, and especially after they spent some time together, of course, Helen Marie loved horses. James rode horses, had horses. Uh, that was good bait, apparently. It worked. And she wanted to ride a horse, and he had a horse for her to ride, I suppose. So uh, they spent, started spending some time together, um, and, and that was very meaningful. But apparently... Uh, James was a man that knew what he wanted, and when he knew what he wanted, he more or less got what he wanted. And uh, he, uh, a humble man, but uh, a pretty, pretty strong man too. And apparently, when uh, he proposed, he didn't really propose. Apparently, uh, when the time came for them to move on in their relationship and take the next step, James just informed Helen Marie that they were going to get married. And so she didn't even need, I guess, to say yes. I think she just agreed, and, and that was that. And uh, the rest, I guess, as they say, is history. Um, the seasons of James' life, I, I, obviously, I didn't know him all of his life. And so there are several seasons that you can speak to that I can't speak to. Um, but I want to read to you a scripture from the book of Ecclesiastes. It says, to everything. There is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A season is a specific time. James lived a life of seasons. He loved seasons. He loved one season in particular. In fact, he would always come to me prior to the Christmas season just to inform me as his pastor that he would be absent for a specific amount of time, not to expect him here, and I had no option but to grant him uh, an excused absence, if you will, for several weeks because I knew where he was and that what he was doing was of the utmost importance. James was in the tree yard. And he was going to be there until the job was done, all hours of the day and night. In fact, there were times when Helen Marie probably just didn't see him very much during those seasons, a man who understood the importance of seasons. And so I want to think about some of the seasons of his life and what we can learn from them. The first season uh, that we're all given is the planting season. It's the beginning of our lives. Of course, when he was born, he had to grow up. I don't know a lot about that part of his life. I'd love to hear more about it, but some of you do, and I hope that you'll reflect on that season. There were memories shared, some at that gathering around his bed the night that he passed, and I know that he told stories about that season of his life. It was also a season early on of starting a family and having children, and part of the season that he began in was that planting season, not just of what was planted in him, but him planting in others. And I know that he spent no small amount of time planting in his children's lives. In fact, one of the memories that was shared was that even before they could reach the pedals, they were learning how to drive. It was just a given. This was a man that loved to drive. He drove a truck. He knew how. He was going to train his children to do the same. And so that was an important season. There is a season where we plant. And James planted. He planted in his children's lives and he planted in our lives. He was still planting up until the end of his life. He was still sowing into us. And I appreciate that about him. The next season, obviously, is a, a season of watering, feeding, 
and weeding that which you have planted. It was a season of working hard. If anyone knew how to work, it was James. He would work. He was no stranger to working hard, to using his hands, to build, to make, to create, to help, to serve. And so he served during this season of his life, and that continued on and on and on. In fact, one of the greatest regrets, I think, for him was that he was starting to have to, in those last couple of years, he was starting to have to let go of some of those ways that he was serving. He really grieved not being able to drive the truck and help as much as he wanted to in the tree farm. And, you know, he was a servant at heart. He served his country through the National Guard. Um, he served many people through his talents of cooking. He loved to cook, and I guess second to that, he loved to eat. He was a servant in that way. He was always doing woodworking. And one of the things that he would do to serve, which is interesting, he would take this little device. Is it still on the table? A phone. And he would actually use a phone for what a phone was originally intended to do. He would call people. How many of you got a call from James at some point or another? Maybe intentionally or not intentionally. I don't know if he actually meant to call. Sometimes he just was trying to figure out how to use the thing. But, uh, you know, he really, one of the beautiful things about him is he loved to reach out, and he was watering and cultivating the relationships that he had. He didn't just sow a little bit. He would continue. I remember hearing from his daughter and saying how, especially here in these latter years, that there would be calls sometimes once a day, multiple times a day. He was investing, he was watering, he was cultivating relationships. You know, it's a wise person who doesn't just plant, but who cultivates, who waters. And he did that in, in relationships. And then finally, there's a season of harvesting. You know, he loved tree season, he loved the harvesting of trees. He also loved canning season. He would tell me, I'm going to be gone. We're going down, we're going to get our, our half runners, and we're going to come back with our cans and we'll and they would spend hours canning. They loved the harvest season. They loved to take what had grown and capture it and preserve it. He was a harvesting man. He loved being with people and enjoying a good meal, not just the labor but the fruit of his labor. And I think about the meals that he spent with some of you. That was something that he loved. He loved to harvest. He loved his family. You know, another word for harvest is gathering. And I will say that I was deeply moved and impressed the night that he passed. Because as a pastor, this is something I see very rarely. As I came back to the hospital that evening, I actually came up the elevator and didn't realize I was coming up, I believe, with Hank and his wife. And as we came up the elevator and I began to walk down that hallway, I started to see the family, as all and many of the family, those who maybe hadn't been there earlier, some who had just arrived, they started to gather together. There was a gathering going on. It was a gathering time. Little did we know, or at least we had some idea, but we didn't know how quickly it was actually his gathering time. The Lord was gathering his harvest to himself. He was being gathered to the Lord just as he was receiving part of his harvest with his family gathering around him. It was a beautiful, honorable moment, a powerful image for us all to pursue. Would it be to God that we would all, at, in those last moments of our life, if the circumstances allow, be surrounded by those that we had sown into? by those relationships that we had cultivated, by those that we had poured into in our life, that we would reap a harvest of love and support as we take our last breath. It was proof that he had sown and he had watered and he had cultivated and he had weeded. You know, even in parts of his life when he had to start over, you know, you have to do that with the garden sometimes. He was a man who learned how to start over, to start again, to do it right, the next time, to do it different the next time. What a testimony to all of our lives. You see, our seasons are all, or the seasons of life are, are, are ordained by God for all of us. We're all in one of these seasons. 
There's a season where God is sowing into your life and you are sowing into others. I would call this a season of faith. There's a time in your life, just like there was for James, when God is wanting to plant a seed of faith, a measure of faith in your life. And you can either accept that faith and accept God, His investment into you, and believe in Him on which you will be saved. Or you can reject Him during that season. Jesus talked about our lives and our hearts as being a soil for ground for a seed to be sown in. He said, but some of the seeds, not all, but some of the seeds, are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100-fold. If you look around today, you're seeing a 100-fold harvest of James' life right here. Look at this. God wants the same for you. He wants you to accept the seed of faith that he is giving you. He's not asking you to have faith without him sowing into you first. But you get to decide, will you let there be a season in your life where faith is sown into your heart? If you will, you will have a new beginning. You will be a new creation, the Bible says. And so I want to encourage you to accept that season of life. And then we're all also called, just as like there's a season of sowing, there's a season of working. We must be workers, like James was a worker. But we work out our faith. Listen to what the Bible says. It says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not, in, not as in my presence only, not as in James's presence only, but now much more in my absence, much more. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You see, there's a time when we take the seed that God's sown in our life and we begin to cultivate it. We begin to work it. We go through trials. We go through tribulations. When he found out his cancer diagnosis had uh, you know, increased and things had changed in his body, he would come to me and he would say, pray for me. Pray for me. He was having to work out his faith. He was having to walk out a difficult time. He didn't lose his faith. He kept his faith. It was a difficult season. But you see, the seed of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of hope, goes beyond those seasons, is greater than those seasons. Are you working out the faith that God has worked into you? Are you cultivating it in that season of your life? And then finally, if you've accepted the seed of faith and received the word of God and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you have lived out your life working out your salvation, what God has worked in you, then there's the hope of a harvest. When the time comes, God harvests us as His fruit, His children. That's a gathering time. There's a gathering time for all of us. And you know, it's not just a time where people... You and I gather, it's a time where there are angels gathered. And those who have gone before, the Bible says there's a great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us. God wants to gather you to himself. He wants you to come into his family. The Bible says, let us, let both grow together. That is, both the wheat and the tares. Until the harvest, and at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. God is a gathering God. He doesn't sow a seed that he doesn't harvest. Amen? And so God's been sowing seed into our life, and we've witnessed through James' life a man whose life has been harvested to the Lord. And each of us have an appointment. You see, seasons are like appointments. Listen to what the Bible says about our Lord who has also gone through those seasons. As it is appointed for men to die once, there's an appointment. Unless the Lord Jesus returns before you you take your last breath, you have an appointment, a season for harvest. But after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. 
to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. You see, there is a harvest time for every single soul. All of us. The Bible says, some will say, how are the dead raised up and what body do they come uh, and with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. James' body became frail. It became unable to house his soul. And so he left his earthly body as a tent. And now God promises that he will be part of the resurrection of the dead. He will receive a heavenly body. That is the promise. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 42, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in honor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, which is Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. That's the spirit that will raise us us all from the dead, that raised Jesus from the dead. That's the spirit that has made James eternal. He's now with the Lord. And so I I have a question for you. The family said, you know, they didn't just want us to remember James. They were very specific. The best thing that we can do to remember and honor James is to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life for James so that James' life could be eternal. So that we, if we receive the same hope and the same faith, that we will see him again. It's been said, the family's mentioned several times, James, he hasn't really died, he's just changed addresses. Right? He's gone to his permanent home. And that is an offering that God gives to each of us, to each of you. There would be no greater way to honor James's life and his memory than to honor the one who died so that he could have everlasting life. That's Jesus Christ. So I have three questions for you. The first question, what seed are you growing? In other words, the seed that's planted in your life, is it a seed of faith or a seed of doubt? Because whichever one it is, you're growing it each and every day. It's growing based on your decisions, your choices, your heart. What seed are you growing? Are you growing the seed of faith? The second question, what seed are you sowing? James sowed many, many good seeds. The Bible says, Jesus said uh, that we, through our works, might glorify our Father who is in heaven. James' works spoke for themselves. There's a lot of good seeds sown. And then finally, what season are you in? What seed are you growing? What seeds are you sowing? And what season are you in? Are you in a sowing season? Are you in a cultivating season? Are you in a harvesting season? God has appointed them all. Let us accept those seasons and embrace those seasons in our own life. If today is the day of your salvation, well, then I'm going to invite you to accept the seed that God is putting in your heart, the seed of faith. To take it and to say, I will now put it into Jesus Christ. I will entrust this faith in him, the one who died for my sin the one who rose from the grave, the one who promises to give me, I can't earn it, to give me everlasting life. And if that's your decision today, I can encourage you that you will too receive the gift of everlasting life that James now has that he possesses. 
And that's what God wants for each of us. This life is a vapor. It's passing so quickly. But eternity is forever. And so, I think it's fitting that James's daughter come and share a song with you, or maybe two, um, reminding us of those seeds that God has sown into our life, helping us to have faith and trust in Him. And so as she comes to sing, I will be available, and I want to ask you, if you want prayer for whatever season you're in in your life, I'm going to actually stand here and be available to pray with you. Maybe this is the season of sowing, the season of planting, where you're accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I would be honored to lead you in a prayer to do that before we leave today. Melinda, will you come? Thank you. This is what Jesus did for each and every one of us. Will you accept it? His heart was broken, mine was mended. He became sin, now I am clean. The cross he carried bore my burden. The nails that held him set me free. His life for mine, his life for mine. How could it ever be that he would die? of suffering brought me healing he spilled his blood to fill my soul and his crown of thorns made me royalty his sorrow gave me joy
That was pretty tough to sing. <laughs> I know. Um, Dad was a unique individual, that's for sure. Uh, and uh, I am missing his phone calls every day, for sure. When he passed, I grabbed his phone, and I dialed my number one more time, just so I'd have it one more time. And I remember asking Daddy, after they gave him the first um, shot of um, morphine, I got down in his ear. We all were taking turns and saying our special things to Dad, and... I got down there and I said, Daddy, and I never call him Daddy, I always call him Dad, and I said, Daddy, do you have Jesus in your heart? And he reached over and patted my hand like that. And that was the last, the last emotion that, that he gave, and I'm sure he would have given more if he could have, because like I said, you know, we all were going down there and saying things to him, but I had to know for sure. I had to know for sure. And one thing you've heard here, before you walk out that door, make sure you know Jesus in your heart because there is an eternity and you're going one place or the other, one or the other, and you need to make sure that you know Jesus. There's plenty of people here. If you want to ask someone, it's real simple. It's real simple, nothing hard, and it's free. You know, <laughs> it's free. Dad always liked to laugh. You got to laugh. But seriously, don't go out those doors if you don't know Jesus in your heart. Absolutely don't. I'm going to sing a quick, quick verse. Um, Daddy loved Amazing Grace. And so I'm going to sing, sing that real quick. Um, and of course, I don't know all the words, you know. And I've sung it. I don't know how long. But... Um, I don't know all the words. I'll get them mixed up and all if I do, but I'm just going to sing Amazing Grace and, and y'all just sing with us and, and uh, just, um, you know, worship that where Dad is. It's a celebration. It's truly a celebration. And we want, us as the family, want you to celebrate Dad and, and be happy where he is, you know, because... Um, if you know Jesus, you go in there too one one day. Y'all stand. Let's stand and sing Amazing Grace. Y'all stand. You've been sitting. We got to go lower. We got to, for me. We got to go lower than that. Amazing Grace.
Let's remain standing. We bow with me in prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you for a life lived worth celebrating. Thank you for memories that we will treasure for the rest of our lives. Thank you for the great witness. Thank you that James finished the fight, that he finished well, that he and his life are an inspiration to us. And thank you most of all, Lord Jesus, that you have made a way through death into everlasting life. I ask God that as we go from this place that we will never forget not only the impact that James has made on our lives, the memories that we hold so dear to our hearts of him, but most of all that we will hold you close to our hearts. And God, I thank you that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I thank you that we have hope. God, let that hope swell up in our hearts and let us share that hope with others and let us not mourn as those who have no hope, but mourn as those who have a future and a hope that is secure, a promise in the anchor of our souls, the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I ask your blessing on this family. Lord, in every moment that is to come, Lord, the moments when they're all alone, remind them that they're not all alone. In the moments when their hearts just seem to break, Lord Jesus, bind up those broken hearts. Wrap your arms around them. God, I pray for your provision for them. Lord, as they go forward, that you'll meet every need. Lord, we know that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. God, we pray that you will help us continue to support the family going forward. Lord, let us live to honor and glorify you most of all. We thank you for this time. We give you the praise and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you'll remain standing, I'm going to usher the family out. They're going to be available for a few minutes in the foyer and just outside the foyer. So if you haven't already, please take a moment to encourage them and speak with them and love on them before you go. The family will remain, we invite the family to remain following uh, our greeting time. There is a meal prepared for you. I would like to say it's burritos. <laughs> I think some of you get that. But it may not be just that. But either way, we invite the family to remain for a time of fellowship downstairs following um, the greeting time in the four year. Thank you again for being here, for showing your love and support. God bless you.